Welcome. I thought uh, if the speakers could say a little bit about what they do and how they got there, what they like about it, and then advice for people in bioethics who are looking forward to developing a career. So, Reed, do you want to start us? All those at once? <laughs> However you want to go. Okay, sure. So, um, well, I was a philosophy professor for most of my career. I always specialized in ethics. Um, I also had a side business that I operated when I was a grad student because they paid me no money, um, or very little. Uh, that business grew, so then by the time I was a professor, I was also mentoring startups um, on how to start a business. And then I thought, oh, it would be interesting if I can combine my ethics expertise with my business know-how. It would be cool if there were an ethics consultancy. But like, what is that? What's the market for that? Who's going to buy that? No one's going to buy you'll sleep better at night. Not in a sustainable way anyway, right? So I just sort of sat around for a while, and then I saw the things that most everyone saw, which were things like, Cambridge Analytica and hashtag delete Facebook and hashtag me too and hashtag boycott Starbucks, hashtag delete Uber, yada, 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 yada. And then Glassdoor gains in popularity. So for those of you who don't know, Glassdoor is sort of like a Yelp for employers where employees can expose all the kind of disrespectful treatment that they have to suffer while they're there. So that's a problem. Um, and so in short, what I started seeing was that ethical, what I now refer to as ethical risk, um, is now reputational risk for companies, especially among the fastest growing uh, segment of consumers and employees, namely millennials and Gen Zers. Um, and I can sell that. I can sell mitigating reputational risk. So I don't always, I don't, I'm not appealing to people's, I don't know, hearts in order for them to, to think that they better take ethics seriously. I, I, I um, rely on their appeal or their concern for the bottom line. Um, and then at the same time, I saw engineers ringing the alarm bells around artificial intelligence, and I thought, oh, okay, well, if they're really worried, um, they could probably use some help, um, and it turns out they can. So I left academia, and I started an ethics consultancy. Wh where am I in this set of questions? You You're doing great. Give me, so, that, give me, give me uh, some more. So advice for people, young people starting, interested in bioethics and seeing the world of careers and life after school for them. Uh, yeah, so to my mind, me, this, is, this is in part something like sampling bias, just given the kinds of um, areas that I, that I work in. I think there's going to be a tremendous need for bioethicists who know things about AI, because AI is exploding in growth. Billions of dollars are being poured into it every year. It's only increasing. There are massive ethical risks associated with it. I can tell you now the engineers do not generally know how to solve these problems. They don't even know how to think about them. Um, some things they know how to do, um, but ethics is just not their thing by and large. Um, and so they need help. And I am I predict that bioethicists will have a large um, will have a large role to play in helping either healthcare companies think about how they develop, um, deploy, and or procure AI, um, and then just other companies, how to do that stuff as well, even if it's not within the healthcare industry, we'll need help doing that stuff. So if I can do a follow-up question. So one is, uh, how do you get clients? So you, in the old days, set up one shingle. That's not what one I have a shingle. Yeah, no, I have... No. One has a website now, I guess. So how do people... That's not sufficient, how, yeah. How do people know that you're out there and can offer insights that they need? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, though I have had experience in business, I, I, made, I think I made a mistake when I launched my business, which was I thought a ton about what's my product, what are my services. You know, day one I get hired, what am I doing? Day two, step by step built it out, knew what I had to offer in really concrete steps, not just, oh, I'm going to help you avoid ethical risks. You know, that's too vague. But getting really concrete, spent a ton of time on the copyright of my website, um, spent a ton of time really refining my pitch, and then I thought, great, ready to go. And then I realized, oh, shit, I have no idea how to find the people that I need to, that I need to listen to me. <laughs> right, so who's, who's my buyer, and how do I get to them? And so... It's hard. It's hard to figure that out. I don't myself think that I have, at the moment anyway, a systematic way of doing it. Um, a lot of it is networking, something I massively underestimated when I was an academic. Um, I, of course, everyone knows it's who you know, but it's really who you know. Um, so I spend a lot of time, you know, a lot of times going to conferences, going to events, talking to people. I'm on LinkedIn. I'll write content on LinkedIn. Um, I've uh, forged a bunch of business relationships through people responding to my content, me reaching out to them. Um, 
I have someone who does PR for me, so that's starting to get me out in the news, and so people respond to that. Um, that's pretty much it. It's right. it's a lot of it's a lot of networking because I'm providing a service that no one's ever heard of. It's not like ethics consultancy is a thing that anyone Google's not yet anyway, right? Not yet, so but soon, yes. um, I have to do I have a lot of my job is making sure that people are aware that I exist. Great. Well, it's it's great that they know. They do increasingly. So yes. yeah. Good. Can so always, they, I can always have more people now. Well, that's great, and, and <laughs> hopefully this will help too. So. Sure, clearly. <laughs> uh, next is Liz. Welcome. Um, so I, I guess I'll start a little bit with um, what uh, what my current job looks like, and uh, and basically it's a my job is is a hybrid of a, a bunch of different things. So um, part of the time I practice palliative medicine as a palliative medicine consultant at Montefiore. I also do clini clinical ethics consults, um, and I teach medical students. I teach a couple of intro to bioethics courses for the first and second year medical students. And I teach research ethics to some of our, our clinical research faculty at, at Einstein. Um, but that's, all of that is, is on paper, 30% of my job. The rest of my job is uh, NIH-funded research um, on disparities in end-of-life care, the role of clin uh, clinician implicit bias in those disparities. Um, so what I like the most about my job, which is one of the questions, is uh, it's the freedom that I have to explore things that, uh, that interest me. Um, most of the time, I'm pretty autonomous. I'm working for myself, uh, ex exploring research avenues that, uh, that, that compel me. Um, I also love teaching because I get to influence the next generation of people who are going to be out there practicing medicine. Um, and my advice probably pertains uh, to those of you who are either uh, planning on applying to medical school or in, uh, already in healthcare, um, and, and that is that it can feel like there's a very linear pathway. You know, you get, get into medical school, you do your residency, you do your fellowship, um, you get your job, um, and it, it can be scary to, to fall off of that straight path, but the, the people who wind up doing creative things in the health care sphere are people who maybe have, uh, have some twists and turns in their career path, um, have skill sets that are a little bit different that set them apart. Um, for example, having an advanced degree in bioethics or uh, public health or something else that gives you a different perspective from, from your peers. And those are the kinds of people who wind up in leadership positions, who wind up shaping the healthcare environment. And we all know that the reason that my career path has been, um, been a very winding one is that we all know that, that healthcare is, is very broken in this country. And I wasn't satisfied just uh, seeing patients one at a time in a broken system. Um, so I've, I've had the opportunity to uh, put my two cents in and, ha and, and help shape things moving forward. Great. And if I can follow up, so we have some physician, number of physicians in our program who are interested in getting into doing ethics consultation. Mm -hmm. So, any advice for them? Um, well, you're you're well suited, but because you have a background, um, I I didn't necessarily set out to be a clinical ethics consultant, um, but the the way that it happened in my career is I, I was a palliative medicine physician first. I was starting to do research, starting to get research grants. And that became very difficult to juggle with my clinical work because it's it's quite rigid. It's you know my I work with a small group of palliative care providers. They can't really uh, cope with me leaving to go do research and then come back. They they need more um, uh, consistent staffing. Um, but I had had a, a certificate in bioethics as part of my palliative care training, and a lot of experience dealing with clinical ethics issues and and end of life, which are transferable to transferable skills to, to a lot of clinical ethics consultation. Um, so when a position opened um, in my organization, I was sort of the natural person to, to step into that position. And it allows more flexibility. It's easier to balance clinical ethics consultation with my research and educational uh, uh, activities as well. Um, so sometimes being the right person in the right place is, uh, is good, but you, you won't you won't have, part of it is luck, but you can't take advantage of that luck if you don't have the skill set to be the person to step into that, that place. Great, thank you. Daniel? Um, so, hi everyone. Um, 
So it was uh, a complete accident that I ended up in healthcare. Um, when I was, uh, uh, as you mentioned in my bio earlier, uh, my academic background is in group dynamics, organizational psychology, how people um, interact with each other and, and experience change. And when I was um, just about to go into my senior year of college, undergrad, I had an informational interview, so it's sort of a who you know kind of thing, with the head of HR at Mount Sinai Health System. Um, super short, I sort of had a conversation with her. I then shouted her on a meeting the next day. Um, then went back to school, finished my senior year of college, and got rejected from every single job I applied for. Um, I can't even remember how many there were. And in April or so of my senior year, I had a phone call with the same head of HR who said, you know, I don't have any money, but you should come work for me when you graduate. I said, okay, I've had um, six unpaid internships already. I'd really like a, a paid job. Uh, and so... We had an agreement that if I graduated and I didn't have a job, I would come work for her. So I graduated and I didn't have a job and I came to work for her. And um, it was a really interesting time to be joining healthcare. And uh, Mount Sinai at the time had gone through a large merger acquisition. There's a lot of change happening related to that. Um, and so I, I sort of became a, a little bit of a, a, a jack of all trades on her team, did everything from explaining a change in payroll and benefits to doctors and to increasing the flu vaccine rates of our employees and negotiating labor contracts. Uh, and eventually I ended up being the person on her team that um, knew something about healthcare transformation, healthcare reform, and, and um, where sort of things were going and what that meant for the members of our workforce. And uh, sort of through that work, ended up meeting uh, the organization I work at now, which is a, a citywide um, industry partnership looking sort of across all, all sorts of different stakeholders in healthcare. Uh, and sort of eventually, because of who I knew there, got an interview with, with this job and, and ended up um, starting at the city. I would say the um, the thing that has maybe stood out the most to me and part of what keeps me connected to this work is, um, so healthcare, is, as you mentioned, is a little bit of a disaster at the moment, uh, or just a big bit of a disaster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot we don't know about the future, but we know it has to be different. Uh, and there's a huge amount of work to do to get there, and there's a huge amount of change that we have to ask for and expect of, of real people's behavior. And if I can tell a, a super quick story, so uh, we were working on a what was effectively a downsizing and, and, and redeployment of, of workers from a hospital that was shrinking its, its footprint. And... Uh, I met in the course of, of working on that and, and some other things, um, an ICU nurse, his name was Richard, and he was like the one of the best clinicians you'll ever meet. He, um, super smart, super caring, uh, loved his colleagues, wanted to see the patient successful both in the, uh, he worked in the ICU, both in the ICU and outside and when they went home. And I met him as an IT consultant looking at, at technology. And if, he, if you ask him about his experience, he had worked at that hospital for, for 10 something years. He got his degree associated with that hospital. And it was the, the experience of change, what it felt like to be in that system, the, uh, the anxiety, the uncertainty, and really the, the sadness, the heartbreak about what was happening to his home family, his home hospital, that caused him to say, I, I gotta get out, right? And, and all the way out. And so for me, it's, it's thinking about people like him and if we don't know what the future is going to look like, but we know it has to look different, sort of how can we understand that future and bring people like him sort of along with it? So, so if you had suggestions for someone graduating in bioethics, yeah. wanting to go into healthcare, any suggestions for them? Yeah, so I would say um, sort of similar to, to, to what my colleague here was saying, that... Um, Career paths aren't usually linear, and I would expect that, and, and in many cases, having different skill sets and different perspectives um, is incredibly useful for, for the work. 
And so really my best recommendation is to sort of jump in somewhere, right, into some workplace, right? And the perspective of um, how do you think about ethical questions, either within medicine or within process or policy or, or systems or people, right, how to work with people, uh, is a perspective that is in and of itself valuable um, to the work. And one last thing, question for yeah. you, and then we'll go to Ashley. So you mentioned an informational interview, uh, which is, I think, are important, but yeah. scary often for a lot of people. You want to say about the role of informational interviews for you or others as you see them? Absolutely. So um, two things, I would say. I think the function of an informational interview Maybe is... Maybe say what it is, just so... Yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, um, the function of an informational interview is to get information. That's, that in, in and of itself is, is what it is. Um, and when you're thinking about your career and where you might want to go, you have presumably some ideas or curiosity of where you might want to go or what you might want to experience or what you might want to jump into. And you probably have a gap between what you know about what that looks like and what it really looks like on the ground. Um, and so an informational interview, being able to go out whether it's something as simple as um, reaching out to someone through LinkedIn or through a connection to say, hey, can you have, uh, would you be willing to do a 20 minute phone call with me or get coffee? And the goal of, of something like that is purely to get information, right? To say, oh, you do an interesting job or you have a career path that looks sort of interesting to me or you work in a place that I might be interested in. Um, what does that look like, right? So that the, the goal of the informational interview is just the, to help you come to a decision point to get more information. When you're actually at a decision point then, you get to the um, sort of, I'm going to apply for a job, how do I tell my story in a way that might be relevant to my audience, whoever the, the organization or the hiring manager is, um, right? But the informational interview itself is not looking for a job, it's just sort of being curious. Okay. It often does lead to a job though. Sometimes. Yeah, okay. So it certainly has for me, right. um, and I know it has for, for many people. The one thing I would caution, though, is if you go into an informational interview um, with the intent to ask them for a job, it will likely turn them away from, from the conversation. And so um, rather coming into it with a, an intent to build a relationship or to learn something from them uh, has a much better sort of track record of being useful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ashley. Yeah, so kind of echoing what my colleague just said here about diving in um, to something and kind of just starting somewhere. That's kind of what I did. I never thought I would um, end up in advertising and marketing, um, but that's where I am now, and I really enjoy it, um, and I'm able to incorporate my bioethics background in it. So I work um, on an opioid and alcohol addiction drug, Vivitrol. Um, and basically, I help to plan their media, their advertisements. We create strategic approaches, um, all with the media lens for um, healthcare professionals, consumers, and also the criminal justice system, which is an interesting campaign since um, it is being offered to any criminals who are in the um, criminal justice system. And so just coming with an ethics background, I think it does um, give you a different lens and way to think of things, and it's specifically working on such a sensitive um, topic as opioid and alcohol addiction. Um, I think you're also able to think of ways differently and also think of strategic ways to target um, you know, your ideal audience. Um, so that being said, um, you know, being I was in your position, like, <laughs> less than a year ago, a year ago. Um, and something, some advice that I would give you is, you know, baby steps. Um, I graduated and like had an idea of where I wanted to be, um, but you need experience. Um, and a lot of you guys are young also. <laughs> um, so I think it's all about connections. It's how I ended up where I am right now. Um, my friend works at the company. She really thought I would enjoy it. Um, it's a young environment, it's changing with the times, you're thinking about pharma from um, an innovative lens, which I think is interesting, um, you know, and marketing is always, you know, targeting with different channels, whether it be videos, even like on social media. Um, so I would say to you guys, just baby steps. <laughs> Great, good. 
So I'd like to open the floor up for questions, comments. So I can keep asking questions, but uh, this is for you all. So any questions, comments? Yes, Kyle. So no, actually, just, we just, uh, uh, I'll just repeat the question quickly and then if people can speak in the mic is, uh, was it, uh, well, let you repeat the question. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, it was in regards to uh, entrepreneurship and starting uh, a business with, you know, a bioethical backbone to it. Um, if it's early in your career, maybe you don't have the, the financial capital to jump into it. How would you recommend or I guess in your experience um, was it beneficial jumping into it a little bit later in your career after you built up a little bit of expertise and maybe capital in that sense? Yeah, I, I had the opportunity to, to do two things. Number one, um, build up an expertise and two, marry right. Uh, <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's totally true. I mean, if you want to start a business, you need to have the right kinds of resources. Um, you need income, and you might not have it when you start a business. So either you better have, you know, I don't know, wealthy family, wealthy parents, um, be w willing to work two full-time jobs, one, your, your, the, the business you're building, and two, the other thing that you're doing to pay the bills, um, or three, marry right. So that's not why I married her, for the record. <laughs> but told, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't a crucial, a crucial feature of why I, can, why I could have started what I did. Um, my wife is a successful businesswoman. Um, she's awesome. So that gives us the opportunity for me to start something. Um, but look, I think that it depends on what you want to, what kind of business you want to start. A lot of businesses, you don't, especially ethics consulting, I, it's not that I needed a bunch of revenue or, or capital to start the business. Um, I didn't need much at all. I needed a computer. That's pretty much it. I needed, you know, a couple thousand to pay a graphic designer to build the website, um, business cards, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what, what did I really need to spend money on? Not much. I used to work in coffee shops. I mean, now that I've got the business going, now I can afford, you know, I have an office and I have someone who does PR and I have someone else who does relationship networking or whatever. It's a whole thing. So, uh, you know, you don't have to, the, when you're starting a business, you want to do it on a shoestring. And unless you're building a physical product, you probably don't need that much money. Um, but if you have ideas in mind and you want to talk about it, I'm happy to talk about it. No, that, yeah, that kind of answers what I was thinking. Thank you. Rachel, let's wait for the mic. Thank you. Um, what kinds of companies do you find yourself consulting for the most? Uh, so it's all over the map. So my two clients are almost polar opposite. My two biggest clients are polar opposites. Um, one is Ernst & Young, so massive, hmm. massive firm. I don't know, I think they do like $35 billion a year. They're in, I don't know, well over 100 countries. So they're massive. And for them, I'm advising specifically on AI ethics. That's, so that's one kind of company. The other kind of company that is my sort of, uh, has been my, was my first client and I still do work with them, um, they are a post-Series A startup in the, uh, they do bottled coffee. Uh, they came to me when they were something like 17 people. You know, it was sort of a mess. 17 people, the founding brothers were three, so, sorry, the founding members were three brothers, all in their 20s, white dudes, former student athletes. The 17 people, there were three women, one person of color. Wasn't a good scene, and he wanted help building the, into an ethical organization that was sufficiently diverse, yada, yada, yada. So... I've been working with them to, as they grow, to, to create that kind of, uh, create for one, number one, create a set of ethical standards, and number two, figure out how to operationalize those ethical standards. That is to say, how do you build it into process and practice? Um, and now, a year later, there are 75 people, and there's, mm -hmm. out of 15 senior positions, 12 of them are women, not including the brothers, and the average woman there makes more money than the average man, and so, you know, anyway, Totally different kind of client, right? That's not at all what I'm doing with EY. Um, and then there are 
product design companies that I do work with. Um, there's one company that does uh, in Sweden that does biochipping. So they do they put a chip in your hand, uh, which gives you access to you know you can use it for your credit card or health your health your patient your healthcare data. Um, anyway, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. The the answer is that like everybody anybody. So, uh, can I ask a follow up question? Um, but uh, EY is its own consulting company, right? It's a called a, yeah, it's an accounting firm, as opposed to like McKinsey, which is a standard management consulting firm. But yeah, it's fine. Yeah. So, like, are you working with them in terms of organizational structure too? Not at the moment. Um, what I'm doing so right now, the bulk of my work for them is I'm a member of their AI advisory board, and so what I'm helping them to do is figure out how to essentially audit an AI algorithm or an AI product for ethical safety. Mm. And there are other members of the board who are more focused on things like functional accuracy. So there are two philosophers on the, on the board, two computer scientists. Um, I don't do much organizational, organizational stuff with them now, but we're talking about doing that stuff. Got it. Thank you. Other questions? Emily. So I personally resonated a lot with this point of being a physician and seeing patient after patient in, in a broken system. And I was wondering if you could speak more to, because I'm, I'm considering like entering medicine, but I think like the underlying philosophy of that is that I like to do as much good as possible, <laughs> on, like on the patient end. So I was wondering if you could speak more to like administrative and research and clinical roles. Um, and how those reflect, like pursuing, like greater, um, greater ethical standards in our current healthcare system. Sure. I mean, I think uh, I think I'll take the opportunity to sort of reflect what some some of the other panelists were saying about, you know, how do you get from where you want to be to where where you are to where you want to be, and um, just to give a little bit more insight into my career path, I kind of came into medicine knowing that I wanted to be part of, um, knowing that I, di I didn't want to just see individual patients knowing I wanted to have a bigger picture approach, but I didn't know what that would look like. Um, so I, I originally trained in internal medicine. I realized that I didn't want to stay in, in that straight path, so I, I took some time out and got my MPH here at Columbia um, while I was doing a preventive medicine residency for the New York City Health Department. So I worked for the Health Department for a while as well. Um, but it, again, that, that's sort of a different mission from clinical medicine. It's, it's a pretty separate kind of career path. Um, so I jumped back into clinical medicine doing palliative care uh, with this idea that I wanted to use my um, research method skills and my population health skills that I had attained in my MPH training and somehow apply it to the clinical setting, but I didn't know what that would look like. Um, so I just started practicing and started doing some of my own research on the side. I was looking at how our palliative care program, one of my, one of my ideas was, or a large idea that's out there in the, in the system is that if we can improve end of life care, that, that might have a lot of different more global effects, right? Because we spend a ton of money on care that many people don't even want near the end of life and doesn't really help them. So how can we, uh, how, how can we change that? And so I, I was looking at how our palliative care service impacted health, uh, health utilization outcomes. And I was just using my own skills from the MPH program and our, working with our uh, data management people to, to try to look at that. Um, and in in the process of doing that, um, I met some with some of the more senior researchers at Einstein, and I, just asking for their help, like I, almost like what you were saying with the inter, uh, the informational interview. Mm -hmm. And they said, "Well, gee, you know, we just lost somebody who had grant funding. Now we have this funding, and nobody to you know do the work. But you have the skill set, and, and this is going to be a match." And, and that really launched me on a different career path away from. Where, where I had more opportunities in, in, in research. So I, so I would just ac echo that. You, you, it's hard to see. I, I, could, I could make up a story retrospectively of, of you know, all, the, all the steps that I took to get here, but 
no, none of you would be able to follow that because it was it was very winding. You just you just start working on things and, and build up the skill sets that you that will be valuable to other people um, and start somewhere. If, if I could maybe add one thing to um, to to your question, so I sometimes think of of um, things in levels. So there's you can work individually one on one with patients. You can work with um, sort of a, a community or a neighborhood or a, um, a disease condition, like all asthma patients or something like that. Um, you can do work like I'm doing, which is at a city level, or you could do something at sort of a, a, um, a policy at a state or, or federal kind of level. And um, while they all have their own sort of um, scale or flavor of impact, if you will, the actual work task can be very different. And so what it means to look at, for example, um, uh, a neighborhood like, like the neighborhood around, around this campus here and say, what uh, health services does this community need? Like the actual looking through sort of data and clinical processes and workflows and which partners to work with, right, and navigating the corporate relationships of, of stuff like that, um, is a very different kind of work task than writing policy at a, at a system level or doing individual clinical work. And so to an extent, I might recommend follow your curiosity and interest more than anything else. Thank yeah. you. That was really helpful. I, I would echo that very much. Like it's part of, part of uh, how I got where I am now is just you know, saying, hey, that sounds cool. And, like, yeah. <laughs> and, and when people offered me interesting opportunities, I took them, and, and that's how I ended up having multiple different parts of my job. Thank you. Uh, Dean. Wait one sec. So you just mentioned about working on policies for the state or federal level. Yeah. If that was your interest, how would you proceed to get a job in that arena? So I'll take a stab at answering the question. I'm sure there, are, just as there are lots of paths into anything, there are, there are lots of paths into this. Um, so there are um, a few different things. So one is you could be in something like research, where you're researching. Let's I'll use your example of health disparities in certain things, and you are using that research to inform policy, right? And so you're trying to connect with with policymakers and, and say, hey, I know something that you might want to know. So that's one kind of thing. Um, you could do things that allow you to get to a table, <laughs> right, with policymakers. Um, whether that's in, in leadership and administration in, in some sort of healthcare organization, um, or in, in my case at the moment, working for a, a government entity or a public-private partnership. Um, you can also do something like work directly for a policymaker, for a legislator, as a as legislative aide or as some sort of staffer, uh, or in some sort of similar capacity for an elected official maybe that isn't writing policy, but then has some sort of political influence. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention, um, because healthcare is so massive and, and complex in, um, in our country, you can do things like work for a union and have a huge impact on policy, or you can work for um, an educational system like Columbia or like CUNY or, or, or somewhere and be able to connect with certain kinds of policy makers and have an impact. And so there's sort of lots of ways to, to get into it. Other questions? Francoise? Just wait for the microphone. Bob at, uh, at Columbia on the numerator basis. I work with a whole bunch of uh, pharma companies. I just did a bunch of uh, lectures in Europe and interviewed a number of them uh, for an update on my uh, on my book on uh, biotechnology. I see that the biopharmas versus what Reed was mentioning, which is the infotechs, uh, have both ethical preoccupation and both are great uh, career opportunities for you, but they're F the focus of their ethical uh, issues are quite different. In other words, the, uh, the, all the uh, infotechs are very concerned about the ethics of AI. Uh, when I interview the uh, senior people in pharma companies, th I would say that probably 70% of their ethics in the US, different in Europe, is pricing. Uh, 
pricing and market access. They're all focused on that because all the scandals are there. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the ethics of R&D to some degree. Uh, Novart has just hit a bump with uh, falsifying some data in their in their R&D. That, that these are the kind of things they're concerned about. When they think about AI, uh, it's not so much bioethics; it's fear. How is AI going to be to di disrupt us? You know, when I ask questions in lectures, are they going to be disruptors or enablers? They all say disruptors. And then when I ask who's going to be the, the worst disruptors, they all say Amazon. They, they are scared <laughs> to death of Amazon. So you know, their relationship to ethics and their focus on ethics is different. What, what do you think? Uh, they should certainly be afraid of Amazon. <laughs> uh, someone told me uh, recently, uh, you know, a lot of people are afraid of Google, but Google always fails at whatever they do. Like they, do they do one thing really well, and then they fail at everything else that they, that they try. But, Go but Amazon succeed succeeds at everything, and they want to own the world. So they should be afraid. Um, yeah, they should, and they are going to get disrupted by AI. There's not a question. I mean... I wouldn't go into radiology now if I were you, <laughs> um, because for everyone, I mean, I don't know if people know, but um, AI is really good at reading um, x-rays. Better uh, than people. Yeah, better than people. As good as people. So, um, you know, radiologists are probably in trouble. Um, and you're absolutely right that there's a bunch, bunch of fear, and there should also be fear around things like biased algorithms. So probably this group all heard about United Healthcare Optum's algorithm. Did anyone not hear about that? All right, you tell the story. So United Healthcare is, you know, massive company. Uh, they had an AI algorithm that made suggestions to doctors and nurses about who to pay attention to when they, the algorithm suggested that it pay uh, more attention to white patients than to sick or black patients. Not explicitly, but that was ultimately what the recommendations came out to because there was a certain kind of bias built into the, into the training data, really. Um, and so now they're afraid of that, and rightfully so. So... Have I, have I spoken to your question? Did you just talk in the mic? It's related to an error uh, that, that's, that's common now in face recognition, which is a narrow type of yeah. AI, which is that uh, experience in ATMs, for instance, uh, a, a lot of the face recognition algorithms have trouble recognizing non-white faces sure. in the yeah. first place. Same thing with voice recognition. Someone with an accent is going to have a problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the Amazon is, is using Alexa in the UK, I just came from there, uh, to educate patients in healthcare. Uh, and, and when you read the literature, you see that Alexa cannot recognize drug names, especially if they do, they're said with an accent. So, mm. I mean, you know, we, we are at the narrow stage of AI we are now, there's still tons of errors. Yeah, there's a ton of errors. There's a ton of bias built into algorithms. Uh, there doesn't seem to be an agreed upon way of systematically mitigating it. Um, some companies are really concerned about it, seemingly at least. So Microsoft, for instance, um, is fighting, or at least they're proponents of government regulation in that area. Amazon is just going <laughs> to get any client that they can possibly get. Um, yeah, then there's hiring, hiring algorithms that are very scary. You take the facial recognition software, you put in some higher, you put it on, um, uh, put in a video feed, you add some sentiment analysis on it, then you rate people to see whether or not they should get hired or pass the first cut, talk about opportunities for cultural bias, um, or people with disabilities not saying things quite the right way or not being able to move their muscles in quite the same way and so it gets read the wrong way. Yeah, no, there's, there's a million ways that it has been and will continue to be all messed up. If I can just say, I think, uh, as I've said to, at various points in the past, as some of you know, so most jobs in bioethics don't have the word bioethics in them, right? So we have students who get jobs working for, you know, the National Alzheimer's Association, writing policy or the Medicaid Rights Center, so, or doing AI or patient, doctor-patient communication issues or marketing in healthcare, for instance, uh, is one. And so I think that um, being motivated by fear need not be uh, uh, antithetical to uh, being interested in bioethics. In other words, it may be out of fear that a company is interested in bioethics. I mean, opioid makers are now interested in bioethics. They're afraid given what's <coughs> happened. So I think 
part I frame in a way is risk mitigation. Totally. Uh, because of course, of fundamental principles of bioethics involve how to decrease risk, how to increase benefits, what the, how to balance those two, how to think in terms of justice, so to avoid biasing against certain groups or having biases in an algorithm, uh, you know, notifying people what should an appropriate informed consent be, et cetera, all important. Yeah, and I should say that, I, I mean, I think people with a background in bioethics have a huge leg up in the AI ethics world. Mm -hmm. AI ethics is, um, it's a nascent field. Um, most people who are in it are what someone I thought aptly described as enthusiastic amateurs. Um, so, you know, engineers with a big heart, which is great, but doesn't make you an expert. Um, or marketers who see an opportunity, and then they talk about AI ethics, but they don't actually know how to think through the issues. They know how to raise the issues. They say, oh, bias is bad. And you say, okay, yeah, now what do we do about it? They have no idea. Um, so people who have a background in something like bioethics have that kind of training to say, okay, well, look, here's how we can approach that problem. Um, that's one thing to say. The other thing to say is that a lot of people in AI ethics are just reinventing the wheel because they don't know anything about the place where ethics has had I would think something like the most success of any discipline, bioethics, right? We have academics, we have policymakers, we have regulations, we have IRBs, we have ethics committees. It's been totally professionalized. Um, in AI ethics, they're like, oh, we need principles. And I mean, there are principles in bioethics, but, they don't, but you probably know that they don't do the heavy lifting. Um, the heavy lifting comes in, you know, case analysis, uh, comparing this case to that case and seeing what the relevant differences and similarities are. And they, that's a kind of reasoning, analogical, analogical reasoning, that the engineers aren't trained to do. Um, so you have a knowledge base that is extremely useful for doing AI ethics responsibly that the people who are mostly doing it right now don't have. They don't even know that they don't have it because they don't even know it exists. So just if I could follow up on that. So let's say we have students, and actually I should say we have a new course starting I think next semester on AI and ethics, where we're working with people who do AI and doing teaching through a boot camp beforehand, how to do coding, and then looking at ethical issues that come up. So what advice would you give? Say someone says, you know, yes, I've just took this course here at AI and Ethics. I'm interested, should I send you my CV? Should I put what into LinkedIn? Should I, how do I so go from here to there? Any thoughts or suggestions? I mean, sure. I mean, I'm not hiring anyone full time at the moment. I have, I actually have a network of, of people mostly who are, um, people with PhDs and are professors of philosophy at universities. Um, and I bring them in on particular projects if the scope is more than I can handle or if it requires a kind of expertise I don't have. That said, I don't have to pull someone who is a university professor. It may be other people, say someone with a master's in bioethics if that's particularly relevant. So I'm more than happy to have people reach out to me and tell me, hey, look, this is what I'm really interested in. This is what I'm really good at. Um, please keep me in mind for projects. Happy to have that. Um, there may be a time when I start taking on full-time employees. Again, once again, happy to look at your resume. Um, and then there are just other companies that, I, that you could look at who plausibly will hire such people. Um, so I'm thinking about AI companies in particular. So like a place like Salesforce, people know the company Salesforce. They really like to tout their ethical credentials. Um, they have two positions there that are explicitly, it is in the title, like chief AI ethics officer or chief AI engineer or something like that. And there's another one where ethics is in the title and they take it very seriously. So I would go if I were you and you're looking for a job and Salesforce seems like a somewhat appealing company, I would start reaching out to people there uh, and seeing what kind of role you might be able to play. Um, and then, my, like I said, I mean, this isn't, I know you, some of you might need a job, you know, very soon, but I think that um, in the not too distant future, we will have companies like Ernst & Young saying, we need, we need people to help us audit the AI stuff. Um, and then they're going to need people like you. So should, should, so should they um, use a term audit? I mean, it's interesting, or sort of risk mitigation audit. I mean, so these seem to be terms, a way to yeah. sort of frame in a way that the Deloitte's or the McKinsey's or the whomever's yeah. may kind of understand. Yeah, that's, that's the language that they understand exactly, is risk right. mitigation. And, and to speak to your point, yeah, they might be motivated by fear, but look, here, here's the way I sort of see things now in terms of what motivates companies. Um, you know, here are three options. Um, 
the elderly person needs help across the street, you don't help them. So, scenario two, you help them across the street um, because you're moved by compassion. Scenario three, you help them across the street because you want the accolades of others. So scenario three, uh, scenario one is the worst. Scenario three um, is not ideal, but it's definitely better than scenario one. Scenario two is the ideal. I should have put that in the other order. Anyway, um, you get the point. Most companies are not going to be scenario two, where they're because they don't have a budget for that. It's what, what is that? I know this is this is sort of like it's cynical thinking, but it's just it's what it's what I encounter. Y you know, they need to have a budget. It needs to fit into their into some line item somewhere. Someone has to own it. It helps if someone's head head is going to roll if they if they screw it up. Minus that, like, are they going to spend tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars because it's a nice to have? Uh, maybe you'll get one or two of those, but typically not. So. Yeah, auditing, risk mitigation, risk identification. It's a language they understand. And we have, as we were just discussing, copious examples of companies getting beat up in the news media and on social media for ethical mishaps, to say the least. So um, that's the language I suggest speaking. Some people really do care. Um, I'll say this, though. Even the ones who really do care, they still often need a bottom line reason because they need to convince other people in the organization to get on board. Well said. Other questions? So one question is, yes, uh, before we go back, so, uh, uh, so uh, I want to give other people a chance if there's any questions. Uh, go ahead, Francoise. Just to add very briefly to what uh, Reed just said and what uh, Bob is absolutely right, uh, to tell you that you should cast a wide net. Don't just look for a VP of ethics. There, <laughs> there usually isn't one in pharma because you would be the main target of everything. But the head of diversity, has to deal with ethics for sure. He would be a great, uh, uh, or she would be a great target for you. Uh, chief patient experience officer. Uh, all of the pharma companies now starting with Sanofi and now spreading to all of the others, including Merck, uh, have them. Uh, and also uh, people who are in charge of innovation because they are looking at macro trends, they would be looking at AI and these kind of things. So just one, uh, one postscript of that. Thank you, it's great. And um, sort of al along those lines, giving maybe a, one variation of a positive spin on something, not discrediting any of the like risk averse and, and needing a bottom line, but there's a lot of work right now in um, healthcare technology, or, or I like I think like a hospital I, uh, IT department or in a population health department that's looking at how do we sort of marshal our resources in a targeted way for our patients, and to to say, okay. The worst case scenario is we have an algorithm that's pointing out um, something that, that has sort of real ethical problems with it in, in a population, but there might be another variation that's like, okay, how do we take 100,000 patients and figure out the ones we really need to, um, from an ethical perspective, give more resources to in, in healthcare? Um, and so there is a bottom line for building out those types of systems. Uh, and to the extent that those sorts of um, teams or departments or, or companies or whoever um, might be hiring people that are want to help them think through the the ethicality of of the of the code they're building, right? Um, there may be sort of a, a positive spin there somewhere. So, how about in terms of a few of you mentioned sort of I think you mentioned sort of um, not quite problem solving skills wasn't the term, but are there other kinds of skills that someone trained in bioethics to think through these kinds of problems. I think this came up in a few of what you said. Sort of, I don't want to say what are the buzzwords, but what are the, 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 the elements or skills you think that someone who's worked in sort of case-based thinking about um, ethical issues should highlight uh, as saying these are things that I'm good at or I can do that employers might, uh, that might resonate with employers. Any suggestions or thoughts? I'll take a first stab at that. Uh, so critical thinking, um, absolutely, first and foremost. I might also say there is a um, ability to look at, at a problem, uh, identify its component parts, identify sort of what might effects be from certain kinds of decisions, 
um, and then being able to communicate effectively about those things that are, um, I'm assuming, skills that you're all developing, uh, and something that no matter whether it's about ethics or about teamwork or about um, some project that you might be working on or, or whatever it is that are sort of immediately valuable to an employer um, to be able to contribute to, to work. Others? Uh, Ashley, any other thoughts on hearing all this? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I just echo what you just said, everything with that. Critical thinking is definitely key. Um, I think also now in a day, like in an age where privacy is a big concern, um, it's also a concern with advertising and media, um, with different states launching different laws, California, privacy concerns. Um, I think it's about um, framing yourself in a way that kind of, you know, makes yourself marketable to the employee um, and to the industry that you're entering into. Yeah. I'll say a couple other places, by the way, where someone might look just very broadly. Um, number one, anywhere you see the word sustainability. Um, so no one, most people don't use the word ethics in business. Um, they speak in code. It's really weird. People are, are afraid. My experience has been their, my diagnosis anyway is that they're afraid to say the word ethics because they don't know what to do with it. So they use terms like sustainability and long-term value. Mm. Uh, unless it's Wall Street, then it's ESG, environmental, social, and governance factors. Again, that's just, that's essentially code for ethicsy stuff. But again, you can't say, there's a long tradition of not being allowed to say ethics because then you're just a pie in the sky idealist who doesn't understand the bottom line. So some of it is like looking at things that say, if, if you're looking at more financial institutions, ESG, environmental social governance, is something to look for because that means they're looking for ways of thinking about how they can rate a company or think about the improving the company along um, criteria that investors are increasingly looking to take into consideration when they do invest. Again, I would say it's more or less ethical investing, but they'll call it environmental, social, and governance. And then sustainability stuff. And then sustainability, I always thought that the word sustainability meant environmental, just straightforward. It's about the environment. Turns out it doesn't mean that. It means essentially ethics. So if you look at like the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, the, the UN SDGs, like that word sustainable all of a sudden has to do with poverty and clean water and education, and I have no idea how it, we jumped from forestry to uh, <laughs> child poverty, because that's where sustainability, that term, uh, originates. Um, so one thing to do is to look at words like that in, that in job ads, um, because that could speak to what really amounts to ethics. And then when you write that cover letter or you have that, that um, interview, you can say, yeah, you know, that's really what I did at Columbia when I did bioethics, because really what ethics is about is blah, 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 hooks up with this UN sustainability development goal or... You know, you can, you, can, you can just translate it into the language that they want to hear, and they, they could be really psyched on it. Um, so I would, I would look for those two words. Two, two other sets of words. Um, so uh, corporate citizenship um, yeah. is, is one. And then the other is something in, in the domain of, um, like, uh, like, corporate social responsibility or, or some yeah. sort of stuff like that. Yeah, there's CSR, it's corporate social responsibility, but my, my sense of things is that's beginning to go away. Oh, okay. Because people are increasingly seeing it as just marketing. Um, <laughs> and so now they're talking more about company values. And then you think values, great. And then it turns out they're not talking about ethics. They're talking about like, the customer is the best thing ever. It's like, that's not, that's not a, is that a value? All right, I guess in some very broad sense of that term. Um, but yeah, but there still is, there, that stuff is still around, CSR, um, and that's also a place worth looking. We have a question from one of our online participants. Yeah, so Naila Ranji, who is actually a physician, um, is asking Liz, um, how to best sell bioethics combined with clinical and research background when uh, not for traditional ethics consultant role? She said, um, have tried the teaching colleagues and medical trainees angle and integrating it into research, but wonder if there's a better way to sell it or show it. So this is in an institution that may not be mm -hmm. a priori receptive thinking, let's hire a bioethicist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, as, as you, you were talking and we were thinking about the sort of buzzwords and, and things that, um, where, where skills can be transferable, 
Um, I started thinking there's a couple of trends in healthcare. One, one is older, which is uh, people have been focused on, um, on quality improvement uh, because there's been an ongoing crisis of, of medical error. Um, so that's another area where skills like communication, systems thinking, being able to take apart a problem into its co component parts would be very valuable. So I think you could you could put a, a quality improvement spin on it, and many healthcare organizations are, are have over the past decade or so been building up quality improvement projects. Um, another area is uh, healthcare organizations are increasingly uh, F their, the finances are increasingly tied to patient experience and patient uh, satisfaction. So that's another area where com communication skills would be important. Um, I would like to add that sort of, uh, uh, as, as I was thinking about my job, one of the, the biggest things that I actually left, left out and, and forgot to mention is that um, when healthcare organizations are, are drafting particular policies, Bioethics is almost always at the table, so it's another way where you can you can make those connections and meet the people who are really making decisions because they always want they they want that rubber stamp of saying like somebody from bioethics is in the room. So even though I do clinical consults most of the time, um, I'm often asked to to be parts of communities where they're making policy. So, so yeah, and I, I wanted to say another thing about ethics committees, uh, not for not in response to this physician. Um, but if you, you, you could look around at tech companies and increasingly tech companies are having uh, sort of unofficial ethics committees forming um, because people in, people in the company start caring. I've talked to maybe half a dozen different tech companies who are anywhere from, um, I don't know, 60 people to 600 people in which some people in the organization just start talking to each other and it find, oh, you care about the ethics stuff? Oh, I ca I've got that concern too. Well, and then they start talking and then they form a committee. They go to the CEO and they say, hey, we've got some concerns. We think we should do something about this. And that actually works. It actually happens. And it's not, it's none of those people's full-time thing that they're just the ethics committee of that company, but they definitely play an active role in, in trying to stand up a committee, some policy, some procedures. Um, and I see a lot of those companies actually listening. So especially when they're younger tech companies, could be biotech, could be AI, doesn't matter. Um, you actually do have some power in those relatively smaller and newer organizations. And there may be ways to get involved in that, even if that's not the, the job, in your job description that you yeah, accept when you got there. Yeah, yeah. And you can even, you could potentially raise it during your interview. I mean, one thing you can do is yeah. say, hey, look, uh, you know, there's, it seems to me, and they say, hey, do you have any questions for us? You know, you might say something like, well, you know, one thing that I find really interesting about is the sort of ethical aspect of what you're doing. And I wonder if you have ever confront these kinds of issues. And if there's a, you know, do you have people thinking about that, that stuff? And were I to come here, might I be able to play a role in that? I mean, that kind of thing shows interest, engagement, forethought, Etc. Strongly recommend doing that in an interview. Very good idea. Other questions? One question I have is you mentioned a few uh, networking has come up, and I think networking is uh, often hard to do. I think it'd be a little intimidating. I know when I was starting out, people would say, oh, you should go talk to this one or that one. And I would think, well, they're a big name. They're not going to talk to little old me. Uh, uh, and then you realize that's important. So any suggestions, tips? If, let's say someone from here says, gee, I should do networking. That's what I heard tonight. What, what do I do? Where do I start? Any suggestions, et cetera? Um, I think using your Columbia network, um, reaching out to alumni. If you, you can just go on LinkedIn, type in a company. Um, and if you have like Columbia on your LinkedIn or your undergrad institute, um, you can find people. Most times alumni want to help you out. Um, and you can just have an informational interview, hear about their experience, and you never know where it can lead. So say you have an informational interview. We started mm -hmm. to talk about this earlier, and then uh, I, I've had in, people come to informational interviews sometimes, and I've ended up hiring them. So I think yeah. sometimes, so let's say you go for an informational interview, you hit it off with the person, mm -hmm. the person in Sinai, 
Yeah. Um, how does one go from that to the next stage of maybe there's a job there? Any thoughts on that? So, um, uh, it really, in my case, right, in, in the example I gave earlier, um, what mattered was the fact that the person I had spoken with happened to have had a position in her budget, or almost in her budget, when I needed a job. Um, and that when she thought about the skill set she needed, I came to mind because of, of our interaction. Um, and that's part of why playing informational interviews as a way to get a job is tricky, even if that ends up being a successful way of, of doing it. Um, I, I would add maybe a couple things. One is, um, let's say you reach out to 10 people and two people respond to you and are willing to have a phone call or, or meet you for coffee or something like that. That's two people that you weren't otherwise going to talk to. And the other people, there's literally no harm in, 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 in that. Um, and then uh, there's also a little bit in, I don't know if, um, how many, if any of you are familiar with um, some of the social science research around the strength of weak ties. There's a lot to in the um, knowing someone who knows someone who knows someone kind of stuff, and whether that's a contact you already have or an informational interview um, kind of person, the you can get a lot of value in that. And sort of along that line, the one question I would recommend you ask at the end of an informational interview um, is who should I talk to next? And have that person make the connection for you. And that way it's no longer sort of a, a cold call, it's a warm handoff a little bit. That's a great suggestion. So another thing is, so you should go to events, go to meetups, whatever, conferences. Um, you're going to go to those, and then you're going to be milling around, and you're not going to have anyone to talk to, and you're going to feel awkward, and then you're going to take out your phone. Put your phone away. <laughs> Just put it back. I'm, I promise you, you will not meet anyone looking at your phone. You, you just need to be awkward. It just it doesn't matter. Like, whatever. They're already not talking to you, so <laughs> who cares if, you awkward, if you're awkward? One of my, I think my second, my second client was, I was at a, I was at a conference on sustainability, <laughs> and uh, everyone, there's like a networking, a pit, like, you know, it's like, a, it's like where everyone goes, like, it's called, cra I always found it so crass, like the, the networking hub or something like that, which I just thought was so, they may as well have called it like the, like, you, let's use each other meeting point or something. <laughs> Uh, but this is what they call it, the networking reception. It's like, this, is, this sounds gross, but okay. Anyway, this is what they call it. Um, and everyone there had their phone on. They were, they, were, they were looking at their phone. I mean, like, at least two dozen people just do, 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 do. And I'm standing there, and I'm like, oh, it's okay. Well, I guess I'll look at my phone. And so I took up my phone, and then I had an internal monologue in which I yelled at myself. It's like, read, put the phone away, go talk to someone. So I put the phone away, I'm looking around, still everyone's on the phone, and then at some point, some guy like looked up. Uh, no, no, sorry, he didn't have a phone. He had just walked in and he looked up and I was literally the only one on, not on my phone. We made eye contact and we started talking. Yada, 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 client. Put your phone down and just talk to anyone. Even if your approach is awkward, just, I've, I've walked up to people and been like, uh, I've looked at their name tag. So what are you doing at whatever? Falafel Tech Co. Or whatever I don't know. Right? Just, <laughs> what's going on over there? Just ask them what's going on. People love to talk about themselves. Just ask them what are you doing over there, and they'll just start talking. And look, sometimes they'll be total duds. Uh, they won't be interesting. Sometimes it won't lead to a client, but whatever. Like you had a nice conversation for a second, it also builds up your confidence for the next person that you approach. Sometimes they don't know they they're not a client, but they know someone who's a potential client, or they know someone who knows someone. And sometimes they're a client. Um, but you need to just put yourself out there and just be willing to feel awkward. It sounds like also after informational interview, let's say, or, or you meet, so do you follow up right away? Do you follow up? Do you, any suggestions? Do you just thank them in an email? Definitely thank them. But the, the always thank someone. Um, uh, although I would say it's a little different if you met someone at a networking event kind of thing um, than if you had reached out and they had agreed to, to speak with you. Right, the, the sort of intensity of needing to have a, a, a thank you note. Um, what I would recommend, I suppose, is um, if you're going to follow up, 
have some purpose to the follow-up. So if it is, um, like, thank you so much for, for, for chatting. I'd really love to learn more about X. Or I, um, you mentioned that, that you might connect me to, I was wondering if, like, if you could give me their email address or if you could follow up. Like, there, there needs to be a little bit of an action there um, for them to, to receive the follow-up and to do something. I don't know if right. you have a different sort of thought on. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like dating. Building business. Oh, yeah. Right? So, like, you know, I got the digits. Like, when can I call? When, or text? I guess people don't call, right? So, when when do I text? And for some people, you got to play it cool. <laughs> you just don't you don't respond right away. And other people, like, oh, they're yeah, they're fine. I can just tell. I can talk to them now. Um, so it, it's a little bit of sort of getting a read on the person. The other thing you can do. Um, Aside from those follow-up questions, which I think are totally appropriate many times, you can also try to, you know, I also hate this phrase, but give value, so add value. It's just repulsive language, but um, uh, <laughs> it's just so, anyway. Uh, um, oh, I, thought, I saw this article, and I really thought of our conversation. You attach the article, whatever. Oh, this reminded me of you, and you could, that, that keeps working. You keep doing that, and that's a way to stay top of mind for those people. Because if you're not top of mind, you're nowhere. There's, there's top of mind and there's nowhere. That's basically how it goes for most like, networky type relationships. And so you want to stay on mind. Say, hey, thought of you when I saw this thing. Or, hey, are you going to that conference? Or blah, 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 blah. Um, those, are, those are easy like one, two liner follow-ups to make it bumps them up in your head. And then again, you just never know. People have, people have said this, that they know someone who knows someone. I mean... This happened, literally happened to me today. This guy that I reached out to totally cold on LinkedIn. No, I, you know, chatted, had like a Zoom call. He's not my buyer. His boss might be my buyer. He likes what I'm doing. He's into it. He forwarded my, my one pager. Didn't go anywhere, yada, yada. But I post off on LinkedIn. He likes it every once in a while. One time I invited him to an event. I got no response. This morning, literally this morning, I got an email from him saying, oh, a Wall Street journalist, a Wall Street Journal reporter reached out to me asking for someone to comment on AI ethics, so mm. you should receive a call shortly. Mm. It's like you just, you just never know when stuff is going to pop up, but you, you still have to do the work of keeping your, you in their mind, just checking every once in a while. And starting early. Right, so don't yeah. start networking yeah. when you need the job. Start networking well before mm -hmm. you need the job because you never know how, when things will, will fall into place or who it will fall into place with. Well, this is fantastic. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I think this is amazing, amazing insights and suggestions. I'll just see if there's any final comments anyone wants to offer. If not, please join me I, in thanking. I'll, I'll, I'll say yes, one yes, last thing. Please, yes. one, sorry, I've talked a lot about like cynical bottom line stuff. <laughs> But it's not cynical. Well, whatever. It doesn't matter. Realistic. Uh, yeah, it's realistic. Um, but here's, here's what I genuinely take to be my competitive, my competitive advantage. Another big phrase, like what's your competitive advantage? My competitive advantage is my 20 years of studying ethics. Right? That's legit researching, teaching, publishing, yada, and that's your competitive advantage. And so you cannot lose sight of, I've got a kind of, uh, of expertise and experience that barely anybody else has. And you need to not forget that and trumpet it at every opportunity. Great, well, them is fighting words. So please, <laughs> please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists.